Video two now for chapter six is going to continue with some of the ideas from the first video, but we are now covering chapter 6.2, talking about the Bohr model of the atom, which is important because it ties into the emission or the absorption spectra that we saw at the end of the first video. Okay? And this was kind of a big question mark to physicists. We'll see why in a second, right? The existence of these absorption and emission spectra. Why are there only certain wavelengths? And this was explained right in the early 1900s by Niels Bohr, which was a giant step forward because it led us to abandon, when we're thinking about electrons, our classical understanding of physics. Because that works for large scale things, but on this tiny subatomic scale, we needed a new field. Okay? And that's something you've probably heard of, quantum mechanics. Okay. So what was the understanding of the atom prior to Bohr's work? Okay. We knew about the nucleus. We talked about those experiments already, Rutherford, etc. cetera. Right. The nucleus has the protons and the neutrons. The nucleus right, has most of the mass, has a positive charge. And then we've got these electrons that are negatively charged. Right, that kind of surround the nucleus. But the question was, how? Right? Knew these things were constantly in motion. Okay? But if we're just thinking about classical physics, that means that electrons going around the nucleus, kind of like the moon going around Earth, right? if they're spinning around in an electrical, sorry, an elliptical orbit, also electrical being electrons, Right, then they would constantly be accelerating. Okay? And if they were accelerating right, with those opposite charges in terms of electromagnetism, then that electron that's spinning around the nucleus should be constantly emitting electromagnetic radiation, meaning we'd be able to detect something coming off of these atoms in terms of radiation. Okay? But we know that's not the case unless something happens to be radioactive. But that's nucleus, that's what we'll talk about in Chem 2. Now, the other thing that would happen, right, if that electron is constantly accelerating and emitting radiation, then it's losing energy, okay? So it's continuing to lose orbital energy, spin around and around and around, and eventually crash into the nucleus itself. Another thing we know doesn't happen, okay? So what Bohr did, his big step forward, was to ignore classical physics in those predictions, okay, because we know that the hydrogen atom doesn't constantly emit radiation, right, so he decided to ignore that, okay, tie in some earlier ideas, the things we saw with Planck, okay, the ideas of quantization, right, certain specific levels, Einstein's photoelectric effect, right, lights consisting of photons behaving as a particle, with energy being proportional to frequency. So Bohr tied a bunch of ideas together and said that, okay, if I have an electron that's just in its lowest energy state, right, I'm not doing anything to it, it's not going to emit any radiation. It will only emit radiation, give it off, if it's falling down in energy. And it will only absorb radiation if it's moving up in energy. And they have discrete levels that they can move between. Those are where the ideas of quantization come in and then thinking about the electron as a particle. That's where we see Einstein tie in. Yep. So we've got a bunch of variables we saw at the beginning in the video one, right? Delta E, the change in energy, is equal to the final energy minus the initial energy, which is equal to H times nu. We saw that before, E equals H nu, H being Planck's constant, nu being the frequency, which we could also put in as hc over lambda, Planck's constant, speed of light, wavelength. Okay, so if we're thinking about that model, right, a transition, it can't be a continuum of values. Delta E here can only have specific discrete values. Okay? There are only certain steps that can take. So if you think about it like going up a staircase, right, you can only step from stair to stair. You can't put your foot halfway between two steps and step down on that, push down, right? So there are set levels that these electrons can move up to or go down to, right? We have discrete values for those possible differences in energy. And that's where we tie in our line spectra. 
right, we see absorption only at specific wavelengths because it corresponds to moving between specific stairs. Sometimes it's going up one step, sometimes it's going up two steps, right, but we can only do it with discrete values. Okay, so Bohr gave us the, his expression for quantized energies, right? En being the energy is equal to k, sorry, negative k, which is a constant over n squared. And n is a principal quantum level, right? It has to have a whole number value. Bringing everything in the Bohr model together with the earlier observations, right? We can insert that into the earlier calculation that we saw for orbital energies. It right? gives us a final equation, one over lambda, the wavelength, equals k, the constant, Planck's constant, c, the speed of light, one over n1 squared minus one over n2 squared. This is our transition between levels. And the big takeaway here is not as much using this equation to do calculations, it's more the fact that Bohr put all these ideas together and came up with an equation that was identical to the Rydberg equation that we saw in the first video, okay, which was kind of a way to right, solidify these ideas. What does that look like in terms of thinking about actual energy levels? Right Down here at the bottom in purple, I've got energy level one, and then up here in blue, energy level two, green three, et cetera, four or five. If I have an electron in hydrogen here, it can only move between these set levels, right? It can't stop here halfway through. It can move up, it can move down, right? And not just between one and two, maybe it's going from two to three, or it can jump from one to four, but it has to exist at those specific levels, and it only will absorb energy to jump up to a specific level, or if it's falling down, it will release energy of a specific wavelength, okay? Up here, we've got infinity, right? If we put in too much energy, then we just eject the electron completely. And that's what we talked about earlier with the photoelectric effect. So what else do we have from the Bohr model? All of chemistry is about having the lowest possible energy, right? A system reaching the lowest possible energy. If an electron is in its lowest energy orbital, surrounding the nucleus at the lowest energy, right? That's what this purple level is on the previous slide, right? We call that the ground state. And that's a key piece of vocabulary from chapter six, ground state and the next, the excited state. You'll wanna make sure you have those written down. Okay, ground state, electron is in its lowest energy orbit. Anything higher, right, I have to put energy in the system to excite that electron up, but once I do that, okay, I consider that electron to be in the excited state. Okay, I've kind of mentioned these ideas previous, right? You have to absorb energy from the photon from light to go from a lower energy level to a higher, to go from a ground state to an excited state. And when it falls back down from the excited state to the ground state, it, it emits energy, gives it off as a photon. And if I'm moving between the same levels, let's say going from one up to two, and then two back down to one, think about the law of conservation of energy, right? The energy that goes in to excite it from one to two is exactly equal to the energy that comes up when it falls from two back down to one. Okay, we've mentioned this as well. Delta E can only have discrete values because I can only go to specific levels. And that explains the line spectrum in total. The other thing to keep in mind, right, is it takes more energy to move up more steps. So it would take more energy to jump, for example, from one to five than it would from one to two. That explains our spectra we've seen before, right? Specific wavelengths that we absorb to move between specific levels. Right, you see there's a bunch of possible transitions, only five lines over here in the hydrogen emission spectrum. There are other things that correspond to higher or lower energies that just don't exist in this visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay. But the big takeaway here, macroscopic things, right? Thinking about billiard balls or bowling balls or planets, right? Those follow classical mechanics. These things on the microscopic subatomic scale behave very differently. That's what quantum mechanics is all about. The only other consideration from this slide, 
the further up you go, right, say to here, three, four, five, the further that electron is away from the nucleus, nucleus is positively charged, electrons negatively charged. Okay? So the further away that electron is, it's held less tightly. Shown here in the slides is an example of a calculation, how to calculate the exact energy to move between orbitals. This is something you'll have on your sapling. Okay, so make sure you view this example plus the solution to first calculate the energy. And then from the first video, take that energy and calculate wavelength. You'll be asked to do that on your sapling. That would not be on a quiz for this spring 2020 semester. So to wrap up the Bohr model, Okay. It was a giant leap forward in the world of chemistry and physics. Okay. But when we tried to go from the simplest atom, hydrogen, to just one more electron and proton, helium, right, the Bohr model kind of fell apart because what the Bohr model didn't account for is electron-electron interactions as well. If I've got two electrons in there, they can repel or shield one another as well. Yeah, so your textbook says that the Bohr model was severely flawed because it still tied in some things from classical mechanics, right? But that being said, right, Niels Bohr is one of the godfathers of chemistry, right? Super important contributions. Okay? So what did it give us? Where are we headed next? Right? Because we've now identified the fact that electrons can only exist in those specific steps, we call those energy levels, right? They're known to be quantized. They only have specific quantum levels and we describe where they are by using quantum numbers. Okay? Quantum numbers is a series of integer numbers, okay? a specific, putting together four numbers specifically. And those four numbers together are used to give information about where an electron is in an atom. Okay? As I just mentioned before, if an electron's further away, its energy is higher because it's less tightly held. Okay. And the lines that we saw in the absorption or emission spectra corresponds to transitions, I said before, steps, but really it's transitions between those quantized electronic energies. And this is an important slide. Make sure you're comfortable with this information because it's setting the stage for the rest of the chapter. Okay. And to give Boris credit, Right, he did win a Nobel Prize in physics for his contributions. Okay, physics and chemistry pretty closely tied to one another. Right. And as I just mentioned, right, different rules of physics depending on the domain that we're working in. Working on the macroscopic scale, things we can see with the unaided eye, works with classical physics. It does not work for atoms and molecules. When we have that, we have to abandon classical physics and move to the world of quantum mechanics. And that's what we'll be doing with the third part of chapter six, learning how to use those quantum numbers and do a little bit of quantum mechanics.